Julie, thanks. The Supreme Court hears arguments today concerning suppressed evidence in a case dating back to 1984. Now, that was when John Thompson was arrested for a murder in New Orleans. After his arrest, a robbery victim saw his photo in the paper and said that Thompson was the man who carjacked him. Now, that charge could be used by prosecutors to fulfill Louisiana's requirement that an aggravating factor be added to any murder charge before a jury could impose the death sentence. Thompson was convicted of of armed robbery and then of murder. He spent the next decade and a half in prison before learning the prosecutors had blood evidence allegedly linking him to the carjacking that did not match his blood type. And he learned that the people in the district attorney's office knew the blood did not match. The new evidence threw his murder conviction into doubt and flipped his life by 180 degrees. We'll pick up the story now with John Hallway. John is a co-author of a book called Killing Time. It's about John Thompson's long quest for justice. He's in town to attend today's Supreme Court session. Uh, John, good morning. Thanks for stopping uh, here first. Thank you. Tell us about this case. It's, it's Connick versus uh, Thompson today, and it will be heard uh, before the Supreme Court. Yes, yeah, so after John was released in 2003, he and his lawyers uh, approached the DA's office and essentially said, look, you know, John spent 18 years in prison for two crimes that he didn't commit because of prosecutorial misconduct. Can you, we don't want to make him a rich man, but is there anything we can do to help him uh, put his life back together? Uh, the DA's office essentially said that they would do nothing. And so in 2005, John and his lawyers representing him pro bono uh, filed a lawsuit charging that the DA's office uh, had violated John's civil rights by failing to train its prosecutors on how to handle evidence properly. New Orleans jury awarded John $14 million, and that's the uh, case that will be heard today by the Supreme Court. The term deliberate indifference, uh, we heard that as well. And, and, and that charge basically is that the DA, it was a, it was a climate of, um, I, I don't want to put any words into your mouth because I don't want to say the wrong thing, but uh, it appears to be a climate of corruption almost there in the DA's office. You tell me how to describe it better. Well, so, so Harry Connick Sr. was the prosecutor, the, D, the DA, in New Orleans for about 30 years. And during that time, there really is a pattern and practice of what are called Brady violations. The, the key Supreme Court case in, in this area is called Brady versus Maryland. And it states that prosecutors have an obligation to turn over evidence that could show uh, that, that the defendant is innocent. And the prosecutor really has no uh, say in that matter. If it's possible that it could be exculpatory, the prosecutor has an obligation to turn it over. There are a number of cases, not just John's, uh, where DAs, uh, where, where prosecutions in New Orleans for this DA uh, have been overturned on Brady violations. Over the, the 30 years, it's the track record of being one of the worst uh, Brady violators in the United States. And so that, that pattern and practice of deliberately failing to train your prosecutors when you know it could cause an injury is, is the basis for John's award. The book is, is called um, Killing Time, which is very clever because it's killing time and he faced the execution uh, or an execution date uh, several weeks out. He could have been electrocuted or, excuse me, um, executed if this had not come through. So it could be killing time and also killing time. Uh, tell me your involvement in, in this whole process and also what, what John is doing today. Well, I, I uh, originally had practiced law in Philadelphia in the mid-90s for a couple of years with Michael Banks and Gordon Cooney, who are the two lawyers that represented John starting in 1988 and all the way to the present. Um, they've represented him for more than 20 years. And in fact, uh, Gordon will be doing the Supreme Court argument. Uh, today in the in the new case. So that's originally how I got to know the story. And frankly, it, it became almost too important a story not to tell. And I think the Supreme Court case, which had not been accepted by the court at the time I started writing the book, only makes John's story more important because the Thompson v. Connick decision, I think, is going to have a huge impact on how we as citizens, what tools we have in our bag to hold our elected officials accountable when they uh, go for convenience instead of, of, of accuracy in areas like this. Um, as for John, really remarkable guy. I mean, since, uh, since leaving prison, I mean, he, he went in as a 22-year-old with a 10th grade education, came out as a 40-year-old with no employment history, no track record, no documentation of anything, uh, has really rebuilt his life and started a foundation called Resurrection After Exoneration, uh, which helps people who have been exonerated of crimes rebuild their lives and avoid recidivism where they commit a crime just because they've been institutionalized and they're more comfortable in prison. He's really become a national thought leader in uh, avoiding recidivism and, and just a remarkable, remarkable guy. It's been an honor to tell his story. So we, clearly, we do not have enough time to talk about uh, exactly uh, what happened. He spent 18 years uh, in prison, 14 years of that in solitary confinement and a very short amount of time to overturn 
all of this, uh, this wrongful conviction? Yeah, John spent 14 years in a six by nine cell, 23 hours a day in a cinder block building without heating or air conditioning in, in rural Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Um, and even after the blood evidence was discovered, which, by the way, was uh, less than one month before his e execution would have taken place, it took another four years uh, to get a retrial, and, and he was very, very rapidly exonerated at that retrial. The book is fascinating. John Holloway, um, also with Ronald uh, Gaither, and we appreciate you coming in today. It's called Killing Time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Steve, over to you. Awesome, thanks. It's 822 right now.